Hey, it's Jordan, the Millionaire Millennial, and welcome back to this series about how to build a software as a service. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about building out the actual SaaS. Okay, so if you haven't watched the previous videos, you need to go back and watch those because this step needs to be done towards the end, okay? You have to do a lot of stuff before you actually build the thing. So make sure that you've seen the previous videos in this series. But in this one, we are gonna be talking about how to actually build the whole SaaS. So let's jump into it. So first off, I wanna say that no coding is required. So that's probably some thumbs up for some people and maybe some frowny faces for others because the thing is, just because you know how to code doesn't mean that you can build a successful SaaS. In fact, it usually doesn't because if you don't know how to run a business, because a SaaS is most certainly a business, then knowing how to code, knowing the technical side of things, doesn't benefit you that much, right? Maybe you can build an amazing piece of software, but if no one wants to buy it, and you built it for a market that doesn't exist, and you don't know how to do marketing, you don't know how to do sales, you don't know how to do anything besides code, it's effectively useless. So it's not a build it and they will come kind of thing because it's a build it and then you need to go find the people and make them come buy your software. So no coding is required. Um, although I will say this, I did learn how to code so I can build my SaaS. But again, it's not something you have to do. So no coding required unless you want to. So odds are some of you watching know how to code, want to build it from scratch. Other ones watching, maybe you don't. You don't know how to code. Good news is you don't have to unless you want to. So whether you're going to code it yourself or not, you still need to answer some questions. And there's still a lot that you need to do when it comes to actually building out the application, right? Building out the SaaS itself. And you gotta answer a lot of different kinds of questions. So you need to know your exact needs, right? And there's a lot of different needs that your software is gonna probably have to fill. Even though it may serve one singular purpose, right? You need to answer questions like, is it you know, a full-blown app, like on the phone? Is it gonna need a login? Are we gonna have to process payments? What kind of functionality are we going to use? Is it gonna be a freemium model, right? What kind of pricing are we going to do? These are all things that you need to be thinking about when you're building the app or when you're even preparing to build the app. You, you have to be able to answer a lot of these kinds of questions. Now, most SaaSes will require some sort of login and will require some sort of payment processor. Now, for a payment processor, Stripe. Stripe is super easy to use, super friendly. And once you implement Stripe, then maybe you can look at implementing PayPal too. But honestly, Stripe is the way to go. I use Stripe for literally everything and it's just so simple to use and their fees are very fair. Now, as far as the pricing goes, I am quite a big fan of the freemium model. And if you don't know what a freemium model is, basically it means that you have a free plan, not a free trial, but a free plan as in a user can come on, start using your software for free, and they can just continue to use it for free forever, right? So the free forever plan. And then you have a pro version. And the pro version is the one that costs money every month. But the, the, the reason that a freemium version or the freemium model works so well is because it gets people using your software. Right? And that's really what you want. You want people to continually use your software because again, you only get paid if people are continually paying you every month, as in they're continually using your software. And so you wanna get people using it in any way that you can. And the freemium model is a great way to do that. So I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of it. Um, I didn't particularly implement it at Atlas, although we kind of tried around with it a little bit. There's a lot of different markets out there for SaaS and some markets fit better with the freemium model than others. One good one is B to C, right? So business to consumer. You are a business and you're selling your software to a consumer. Great example of this is Google's products, right? So you can use all sorts of Google's products for free. Google's Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides. And you can use all of these for free, but they have a pro version, right? Where, for example, Google Drive, you get a bunch of extra space and that costs you a certain amount per month, right? That's like the upgraded version. And that's kind of what I mean by freemium is you've got a lot of free parts to your software, but then you have like the upgraded professional versions that people that need more would pay for. Now you certainly don't need to give away as much as Google does because Google makes most of their money on ads and so it's not actually through their software that they make the majority of their money. But that's just a good example of how you can have a B2C 
product that you can have a pro version. Now, of course, there's always B2B, right? Business, selling to business. And most B2B products that I've seen recently have free versions, right? Have freemium models. There's a ton of them out there that you only pay if you use a certain amount or you only pay if you want to upgrade and have more features. So the freemium model is a really good idea. Now, if you are going to code this yourself or you're going to find a co-founder, which I'll talk about in a second, one thing that will really help is not building the entire thing from scratch as in with absolutely nothing. There's plenty of open source templates and open source boilerplates that you can find in all sorts of different repositories, mostly on GitHub. So if you just go to GitHub and you search for, you know, login SaaS or SaaS with login capability or SaaS with Stripe integration or something like that, you're gonna be able to find a lot of different uh, infrastructures that have already been built by other people that have open sourced it, as in you can use it for whatever you want to use it for as long as you make sure it has a certain license like the MIT license. That means that you can use it for commercial purposes, right? It means that you can take that code, you can do whatever you want with it, you can customize it, make it your own, and then you can build on top of it. And that's kind of the world of coding as we know it is building on top of what other people have built before us, right? So every language is built on top of, you know, something else that goes underneath it, right? All the way down to just binary zeros and ones. So if you are going to code, and even if you're not, um, and you want to, you know, help your co-founder find something, you can look through GitHub and see if you can find, you know, other boilerplates or templates that people have made that you can build on top of. Now, the last thing I want to cover here is finding a co-founder, because like I said, you don't need to know how to code. But if you don't want to code, then you either have to build a SaaS using codeless software, which there's some out there, but honestly, they're not very good. Um, and so I would go the co-founder route. So you basically find somebody that does know how to code and you give them a percentage of the company. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, I don't want to give up any percentage of my company, blah, blah, blah. Well, then you either are about to pay a lot of money to hire a developer. You're about to pay a lot of money to hire a freelancer pay a lot of money to hire an agency or you're about to learn how to code yourself. So those are kind of your options there. So I like the co-founder route because then you can focus on building the business. Because again, this entire series is about building a SaaS business. It's not about learning how to code. So learning how to code is a lot. I'm not going to lie. It's, it takes a while to do that. So learning how to code on top of learning how to run a business is going to take you a long time. So if you can find somebody, that already knows how to code and you know how to build a business, you bring those two skills together and you can together build a very successful SaaS. And so, you know, I would at least consider finding a co-founder. Now, a great place to find co-founders, I mean, you can find them all over the web, you know, Reddit, Facebook, whatever. But uh, there's a site called Indie Hackers that has a category, a section of the website that's exactly made for finding co-founders. Like that's the whole purpose of the entire section is, always has people looking for technical co-founders, which are the people that know how to code. And there's tons of people that know how to code looking for non-technical co-founders, people that run the business. So there's always people looking for the other in this group. So uh, again, Indie Hackers, I think is where, if I was looking for a co-founder right now, that's where I would go. And I would post my idea and I would say, this is the market that I wanna get into, this is the product, this is basically what it's gonna do. I need someone to build it. I need to you know, partner with somebody that knows how to build this. So that's exactly what I would do if I was looking for a co-founder. Now, one thing I wanna point out when it comes to co-founders is that you should try to keep majority ownership. In fact, in fact, you, you really should keep majority ownership. Um, and you don't wanna do something like a 50-50 split. So the problem with 50-50 splits in, in, in a non-technical co-founder, ideally will understand this because the thing is, Whoever's idea it is, and whoever's gonna kinda do a lot of the upfront work, like verifying the market, which I said was one of the most important steps that you shouldn't skip. If that person does that, then they should have the majority ownership. So for example, if you're watching this series now and maybe you're technical as in you know how to code and you wanna go to Indie Hackers and find a non-technical co-founder to run the business side, if you see someone posting their ideas, you should take not the majority ownership, okay? So whoever kind of got the bar rolling first should maintain majority ownership of the company. Now, again, the reason you don't wanna do 50-50 is because you can reach impasses. Essentially where you get to a point in the business 
where you both disagree on the direction to go. And if you both have half and half, then the business can't go anywhere and it'll just die right there at the crossroads. So if you're on a road and you, you, know, you're, you wanna go this way and your partner wants to go this way, then you, you have to agree, right? You have to agree in a 50-50 split, otherwise you will just stop at that crossroads and your business will die. So you need to make sure that you are split appropriately with your co-founder um, so maybe 70, 30, 60, 40, even you know, 49, 51. But as long as you're maintaining the majority ownership, you will have the say on the direction that the business goes. Once you've found a co-founder, if you're gonna go that route, and once you've kind of maybe found a boilerplate or a template you wanna build on top of, and once you've determined all of your needs and everything that the software is going to do, then we can talk about actually launching the software. So after you've built everything and everything's good to go, we've got green lights, then we can talk about launching and scaling the software. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next video. So I'll see you there. Bye.